interaction is required for effective diplomacy. Diplomacy is all about relationships, all about it. And it, it, as war is about violence, diplomacy is about dialogue. You have to have dialogue sometimes in very difficult places under very difficult circumstances, and we have been doing that for years. I had two careers in the Foreign Service. One was as a child, and the other was as an adult. And nobody recognizes or we've forgotten the fact that during the Berlin airlift, not only had the United States government decided not to evacuate Americans in the presence of the Soviet threat, but they were bringing Americans in. So amazingly enough, um, a woman from a small village in upstate New York came on a troop carrier with a mother-in-law she didn't like, an 18-month-old and a three-year-old, and where were they headed? To Berlin during the airlift. So we have always looked at the risks versus the, the benefit of the dialogue that needs to go on. I was raised in the Foreign Service um, from a father who went to Germany with the occupation forces to implement the Marshall Plan and then um, joined the Foreign Service. So I spent the first 16 of 19 years in Germany, France, Pakistan, and Iran. Graduated from the Tehran American High School. Yeah. No longer in existence. I came back to the United States at the age of 19, having been able to fly by myself from Tehran, Iran, to Cincinnati, Ohio, but I had never made a long distance telephone call and I had never used a washing machine. So those are the, and I had never been alone in a car with a boy before, and I had never lived anywhere more than four years in my life. Up until the mid-70s, if a woman officer married, she was to resign. Uh, my mother, who was a Foreign Service spouse, had her performance as a spouse, not as an employee, as a spouse, and part of my father's performance evaluation. And I and my siblings were raised with everything you do reflects on your father. And it did. Um, I joined through the Affirmative Action Program that State Department opened up um, as a result of a decade of a class action lawsuit. I think the challenges of being a woman exist in every culture, and there are um, alpha males who are really easy to deal with, and then there are alpha males who are not. What I have found is, particularly if you um, interact in private, that women have huge advantages over men because we can say things and get away with it. We can say things with a smile. And as in, Mr. President, you have to stop stealing. We cannot continue to give bilateral assistance if it steals. Now, were a man to say that, first of all, he wouldn't use that language. Secondly, it would not be in the same, uh, you would not get the same kind of result. I actually told a minister once to do that, and he said, we'll stop. <laughs> I'm sorry, we have to do more than that, just say you will stop. So there are great advantages to being a woman, and I have found in speaking with women leaders around the world that they echo the same thing. Unfortunately, what is difficult, and it is around the world, is that it takes greater effort to be heard as a woman. Even if you get to the table, being heard, not being interrupted, number one, um, having the 
the self-confidence to jump in um, and, oh my gosh, actually interrupting. And thirdly, getting your point across um, takes energy and effort from women that I don't think it takes from men. Let me begin by saying that um, I am all about leadership. I truly believe that we have a role to play both as nation and as individuals. And the Marshall Plan was an example of transformational leadership. Transformational leadership is when what happens, the process by which partners get together and determine a common goal and in the process of arriving at that goal are changed for the better. The Marshall Plan is a wonderful demonstration of that because after World War II, Europe had fought itself into total devastation. The United States came along and said, if you all, you European countries, many of which have been fighting one another for centuries, if you all can get together and get a plan, we will help you fund that plan. That was the basis of the Marshall Plan. It changed Europe forever, and it changed the United States forever, both for the better. There are two ways of exercising foreign policy. One is through war, and the other is through peace. We have done both simultaneously, and we have exercised war without diplomacy. So uh, the two are linked. As a baby boomer who grew up in post-World War II Europe, I have seen my country go through World War, the end of World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnamese War, the Viet war in Vietnam, the war in Iraq twice, and the war in Afghanistan. And we still have some of the same issues we went to war around. Diplomacy has a place, I think it is much harder than war, strategically, and it is the foreign policy tool of the 21st century. It's a fact of life in this country that the funders of the United States government, as well as many of the presidents, have preferred utilizing the tool of war in the Department of Defense. The fact is less than 1% of the budget of the United States goes to foreign affairs. The Foreign Service, the professional corps of diplomats who implement diplomacy along with our civil service colleagues overseas has always been underfunded. Colin Powell did come and ramp up the diplomacy through diplomatic readiness, I think is what he called it. And then we went back again and then we go up and down. You cannot fund a multi, an international global institution um, with fits and starts of resources. That's a challenge that still exists for the Department of State and the American people. I was a close-up witness to a genocide, and I was a survivor of a terrorist attack. And I spent, in addition to that, I spent three years dealing with issues of conflict in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I spent three years running around the Sub-Sahara telling murdering, murdering um, thugs to stop killing their people. You're shooting and you're talking. Um, when there are times when the shooting is such Talking is not possible. So one of the lessons I came out with from the three years I spent dealing with conflict in Africa is that sometimes um, you cannot stop 
the conflict between two parties. They're come, they're at some, sometimes talking is not possible, but you need to be ready to jump in as soon as it is, and that requires relationships that um, are maintained, even if they're maintained quietly behind the scenes, or if they're relationships you have to draw back upon um, from the past. It is the relationship that stops the shooting and starts the talking. I was the U.S. ambassador at the time. I had um, been serving in Nairobi for two years, working with a fabulous team of 17 different U.S. government agencies and focusing on teamwork. And I want to emphasize that because we could not have survived as we did had we not been working together for two years. Um, I had been sending cables back to the Department of State advising the Department of the Security Vulnerabilities, particularly the location in which we were situated. And the response that I received was, there's no money, you're not on the list, um, you won't be on the list, and besides, we deem the terrorist threat level to be medium. So, so sorry, we'll send a team to um, do this and that in your location. And three months after I wrote a letter to the Secretary of State about my concerns, because as ambassador, like all ambassadors, I had a machine signed letter from the President of the United States telling me that I was responsible for the security of American citizens, not just U.S. government people, but American citizens. I think ambassadors are the only Senate confirmed employees of the U.S. government to actually get a job description. That job description said, you need to keep people safe. Because I could not get my bureaucratic colleagues to help, I wrote to the secretary. Three months later, we were blown up by Al-Qaeda. This was Al-Qaeda's first attack on the United States, simultaneous to an attack on our embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Some would say that um, what happened in Benghazi when Ambassador Chris Stevens and others were killed in the special mission in Benghazi, which was not secure enough to keep the assailants from coming in, that that was another example. And yeah, I think we will continue to have this problem until we get um, continuous funding for the Foreign Service. And I mean continuous. I don't mean bust and boom. Um, I mean a, a level of funding of which we can forecast. So that's number one. Number two, I think we need to focus very carefully on what we're trying to accomplish in a certain country and who needs to be there to do that. Then it is, what does Washington need to do to help in terms of intelligence, in terms of ideas, in terms of um, not just fiscal but human resources, in terms of technology? What does the headquarters need to do to keep the people who are there implementing specific objectives safe? Congress is ultimately the branch of government that provides the funding for the executive branch. Um, it requires the request that comes out of the executive branch, which has, frankly, often been the problem. The um, executive branch hasn't asked, and the congressional branch hasn't given. So the, the switch needs to begin, and, and the, uh, the mantra is that uh, the American people don't understand what we do, and that as foreign service officers, um, and, I, and foreign service officers writ large, not just State Department, but Commerce, AID, Agriculture, and so forth, um, that the foreign service people have no constituency in the United States. And I frankly think that's not true. 
how many Americans have passports? Uh, the, first, the, the first and foremost obligation of people in the Foreign Service is to help American citizens overseas. How many amazing stories are there of citizens overseas whom we have helped that are never told because you get into this, this mantra again, well, no one's interested, therefore we won't tell the stories, therefore no one will be interested and Congress won't be pressured to give money. And I thank you for doing this series. It was a beautiful Friday morning, mid-morning. It was the day of the week when we had that event everybody looks forward to, which is the weekly staff meeting, which was usually held in my office. But I had finally gotten a meeting scheduled with the Minister of Commerce to talk with him about the visit of then Secretary of Commerce Daly to Kenya. And so I was not present at the staff meeting. Um, the minister's office was in a high-rise building across from the small parking lot, which the U.S. Embassy shared with the members, some of the members of this high-rise building. Um, I was on the 21st floor. We had gone through the photo op that usually begins ministerial kinds of meetings. The press had just left. We had gotten our requisite cup of tea. I was sitting next to the minister on a couch and we heard a boom that sounded to me like a construction boom. And I asked, is there a construction going on? And he, the minister, as well as many of the other people in the room, got up and started walking to the window. I don't know what instinct kept me from getting up. Um, but I was the last one up and had taken a few steps when this boom, uh, huge percussion came and threw me back. I, I'm, I, a shadowy, some shadowy figures um, went by. I thought simultaneously, I'm going to die. And it was, uh, you know, endorphin induced sort of dreaming, ha, huh, so this is what it's like. At the same time, every cell in my body was in panic mode because I was on the 21st floor. I was waiting for the building to um, collapse and was waiting, uh, literally um, tensing myself for the fall. Um, and I came to, one of my colleagues came rushing back to the room and said, Ambassador, we have to get out of here. And we began walking down 21 endless flights of stairs, a huge, long parade of silent and bleeding people. I was focused on keeping my feet on the stairs. I was concerned. Um, people were quiet. As we went further down the stairs, more people joined us. Some um, shouted Karibu, which is Kiswahili for welcome, as we were joined. Somebody started singing a hymn. I remember we passed the body of either a deceased or unconscious woman, very carefully. And we got to a, um, a point when suddenly the slow parade stopped and uh, we heard voices yelling, hurry, hurry, fire. And the um, smoke came up and I thought, I'm going to die, but at least I'll be asphyxiated. I'm not going to burn to death. And in the meantime, the mantra, I mean, I was just thinking, uh, I just need to get out. I need to get to the embassy. I'll be okay. We'll have a medical unit. We, we did have a medical unit in the embassy. My, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, gonna, <clears throat> my colleague and I exited the building and he said, Ambassador, there's press, because remember we had just finished the photo walk and many members of the media 
had come out of the building just minutes, maybe even seconds before um, the bomb, the truck bomb was detonated. He said, um, Ambassador, uh, put your head down. There's press, and he literally put my head down. I later asked him, how in the world did you think of that? And he said, I think I saw it in a movie. At any rate, I was, was walking with my head down and saw shards of glass and twisted, uh, twisted steel and then came upon the burned corpse of what used to be a human being and my eyes came up. And there was the embassy without um, a rear wall, flames of cars. Um, it, was, it was truly a hell, it was truly a hell. And the seventh story office building next to the embassy had totally collapsed. And it was real clear to me that there was not gonna be anyone to take care of me. And I had better get in gear and that's what I did and our team of people turned from victims to first responders because we were an embassy. Um, not only that, there was not, no 911 in Nairobi at the time. So the people at the embassy came out of the embassy, regrouped, turned around, went back in, what was at that time a, a death trap because a fire had broken out on our generator. The generator had turned on and we had electrical wires that were um, just strewn about and streaming as the water main burst and the water was coming up in the basement and our colleagues chose to go back in and bring out the people they could find, stay with the people who were wounded, and ultimately bring out the body parts of their friends and colleagues. And then we started to piece ourselves back together again. And we did it as a community of Americans. Americans were given the option to leave. Very few chose. We chose to stay. Our Kenyan colleagues had no choice. And together we accomplished um, what I look back now as extraordinary. And the lesson I learned is that if you can create community, then you can face um, almost anything, even if it is extraordinarily, extraordinarily painful. And it comes back to why I am a diplomat, is because diplomacy is all about creating community internationally. Part of it, I think, is leadership. Um, I, I considered it, I, I came from a leadership training background, so I knew what I was doing when I came to Nairobi. Um, I had been raised in the Foreign Service, and I knew the impact that an ambassador can have. Um, an ambassador can, um, cannot, cannot help people to be happy, but can create an environment in which people can thrive. An ambassador can also create an environment in which people can be really miserable, have opportunities for great misery. I knew the difference an ambassador could make, and my husband, who called himself Top Spouse, so Top Spouse and I walked into that community in Nairobi wanting to um, provide a sense of community, and most overseas missions are small towns. That's what they are. And it is very easy to um, do things as community. You, you start with the children, you take care of the children, the schooling, and uh, what are the teenagers going to do when they have nothing to do? You know, they're 16 years old and you don't want them rambling around the downtown, so what do you do with the teenagers? And it's pretty basic um, and important stuff that we have in the United States ready-made through clubs and schools and so forth, and overseas requires much more intentionality. 
But once you become a member of that community, um, God, they're for your family forever, especially in times of crisis. I was actually, uh, having come out of three years as Deputy Chief of Mission in Senegal in 1992, I had the honor of being asked if I would be I would be interested in being the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Rwanda. And of course I said yes, because, um, sure. Unfortunately, because of a medical condition, we could not get a medical clearance for my husband. So the choice was to say no, which you just don't do, to separate, or to have my husband Richard come over as a tourist, as, a, as someone not affiliated with the government, which is never a good idea. And I faced my career and home life eye to eye and said no. I ended up um, a few months later as the Deputy Assistant Secretary to the Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, George Moose, and got the portfolio for all cross-cutting issues in the 46 countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, everything that crossed borders. I spent most of my time on conflict because you can't have development, you can't, there are other things, you, you can't fight HIV AIDS if there is conflict, so I spent much of my time on conflict. Um, Rwanda was a particular portfolio, and the day the Assistant Secretary George Moose was out of town and the number two was out of town, I was acting Assistant Secretary when the plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi went down and the chaos, which was the beginning of the genocide, began. And there I was, uh, with Rwanda all over me. I never believed in destiny before, and I really began to wonder why it was that um, I would have such an intense relationship. I had visited Rwanda two weeks before the plane was shot out of the sky. I had visited both parties. Um, government and the Rwanda Patriotic Front, urging them to come to agreement on a parliamentary seat, one parliamentary seat, so that the transition government um, could be put into place. The peacekeepers, which the UN had placed in Kigali to help maintain or create and maintain peace, the peacekeepers could do their jobs, then the people of Rwanda could um, move on toward a better future. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and I ended up um, spending most of my time for the remaining weeks of the genocide um, focusing on what we can do to stop the killing within the parameters of U.S. policy. The parameters of U.S. policy were we will not intervene, we will not ask anyone else to intervene, we will not provide resources, and we will not ask anyone else to provide resources, but we will remove many of the peacekeepers. So under, that, uh, under those constraints, it was, well, go ahead, prove whatever you can do to make it better. Um, make it better. So I ended up, um, th th this sounds pathetic, but again, what tools do you have? Keep talking, right? So I ended up um, making telephone calls at 2 o'clock in the morning because it would be 8 o'clock in the morning Kigali time, talking to the one of the p members of the government that was masterminding the genocide and saying, stop it, stop the killing with bizarre conversations. There was one um, 
in which he said, oh, madame, I cannot stop the killing. I have a, I have a civil war going on. And the spontaneous demonstration of people is something I do not have the resources to address. I said, well, at least stop the hate radio. Oh, mais madame, um, we are a democracy. We believe in freedom of the press. I mean, that's the kind of truly bizarre conversation. I will say just to bring this to um, full closure, uh, many lessons I learned from the genocide. One of the lessons is that justice sometimes takes a very, very long time. The man to whom I was speaking was a man to whom I said, we will hold you personally accountable. When I was in Nairobi a few years later, the prosecutor of the Rwanda Criminal Tribunal came to town, paid a courtesy call, and said she and her deputy were on the way to Cameroon to arrest this man for genocide. The man is now in jail. Justice sometimes takes a long time. I don't want to make any comparisons. Um, it, was, it, it was a different time, it was a different world, it was a completely different conflict. Um, the, in Somalia, part of what we were doing was backstopping the United Nations. The United Nations is not in Syria. So it is um, a, a, a completely different situation. And we had not finished two wars which we had not won. Um, the so-called battle fatigue of which Americans are experiencing now was not the case at that time. I do think it is uh, very hard to go into a conflict if you don't have an exit strategy and if you don't know what it is you're trying to accomplish. It is very difficult to come up with a crystal clear uh, objective of what we would be accomplishing in Syria, which is in the middle of a civil war, as well as the middle of, a, of an Islamic um, knockdown drag out. I do believe, if I may say this, there is a, uh, it's funny how, how uh, things link. At the trial of one of the perpetrators of the Nairobi bombing, the American people and I learned that Osama bin Laden had trained the people who shot down the Black Hawk helicopter in Somalia. What happened in Somalia had a major impact on our policy in Rwanda and came back to bite us in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam to say nothing of the coal and 9-11. And so you can see traces to Al-Qaeda in Somalia. You can see traces of Islamic, well, it can, it's Islamic fundamentalism, these young gang bangers who call themselves um, messengers of the Lord um, are nothing but young gang bangers and they need to be put in their place just like the gang bangers of Al Qaeda needed to be put in their place. So if we come with an international consensus, which to me needs to include Muslims, this is not just an American issue. This is an international community issue. If the international community can agree that the behavior of beheading people is unacceptable, no will not stand. None of us will stand for it then we can move on and perhaps end up with, again, the dialogue and the conversation with the Syrians, the Iranians, the, uh, the Jordans, although well, we have a great conversation with them. Maybe we can begin conversations that can address other issues. I had, yeah, well, I, Yes, it was quite clear. If you read back, not only uh, the cables that the American Embassy in Kigali were sending back to the Department of State, but the information that was available in the, at the United Nations, it was quite clear that were we paying 
close attention, we would have seen the, the um, beginnings of what could end up to be a genocide, the human rights abuses that just continued and became worse and worse and ultimately resulted in genocide. Why did we choose not to look at it? Because on, um, on the policy agenda, issues of Africa were at the bottom and issues of Rwanda were hardly, um, were not top of our interests in Africa. This was a time in which South Africa was going through its transition which was very important to us. It was the time when we were trying to get out of Somalia and hand Somalia back to the United Nations. So there were many other issues and um, no one was looking. I have a couple, okay. I will give you, um, let me give you two. One concerned a, a breakthrough uh, with the president, then president of Kenya. It's one of my favorite stories. The, the president of Kenya, Daniel Eric Moy, uh, was really irritated that the United States government was sending a woman to replace a woman. Uh, he was not in good odor in the U.S. government, and he thought that um, until and unless he got a white male, um, it was, he, he would not be seen as in good order, i.e. that we make decisions, well, let's send a woman because, well, that will irritate him. So I had a hard time getting in to see him for a few months. I finally did get in to see him. And at one point, he, um, he was a man like a lot of potentates who gave himself license to get angry and emote and stuff. And at one point, he, early in our meetings, he said, um, I've never once heard you say anything nice about my political party. And I said, Mr. President, you've never once heard me say anything nice about any political party. And he said, oh, you're right. And that transformed our relationship. It was, it was a moment of, wow, now I can talk to this man because I won't be bullied and um, I won't be yelled at. And sure enough, um, I wasn't. And we got some really important things done for the U.S. government. Another, um, this was a, a wonderful occasion that I saw, both in Kenya and Guatemala, where I served as ambassador. I made a point to go out to countryside. First of all, that's why we joined the Foreign Service, right? It's to get to the back of beyond. And secondly, to encourage um, girls to stay in school and encourage the parents not to give their girls off in marriage early on. And I was in the back of beyond on the border of Somalia um, in Kenya under a tree with the village elders all around and the media that always came with the U.S. ambassador. And a 14, 15 year old stood up girl um, and recited a poem she had made all about, please keep me in school. Um, please my mother, please my father, please keep me in school. Now I know that they wrote that because she wrote that because she knew that was something that would please me to hear. But the courage of that child, that young woman to stand up in front of her village and say, please keep me in school, was profoundly um, affecting to me. Good on you, you know? And again, that's what you thought, wow, look at me. I'm here with a 16-year-old or helping, a, whatever, a teenage girl get up enough nerve to say, you know what, I am me and I want to stay in school. Join the Foreign Service, you can do that too. Advancing American, America's economic interests is um, part and parcel of being an ambassador. We are there for American citizens, American citizens tourists and American citizens business people. 
um, often I would end up as the ambassador in Guatemala, for example, um, uh, as the person to whom Americans would come if they had problems with the company, um, problems with the government getting paid, problems um, in a lot of developing countries. It is very difficult to get things done. If you think American bureaucracy is hard, you ain't seen nothing yet. So one of the um, things that I did consistently, always behind the scenes, was to promote American businesses um, to make sure that there was a level playing field for contracts and to make sure that whatever impediments to American business were being placed in front of them, um, that those impediments would be reduced or actually go away completely. That it is an institution of the 20th century. It needs to become a global organization of the 21st century. We need a new Foreign Service Act, I think. Um, the Foreign Service Act is just a little bit older than I am, or younger, I'm sorry. And um, I'm in the third age, and the Foreign Service should not get into the third age. The Foreign Service needs to get into the 21st century. That requires, and what a fabulous challenge for um, people coming in, for our Congress, for the American people. Here, the United States continues to be the most, the country that most reflects the world. That is one of the reasons I loved being an American diplomat, because when I looked out over the people in our embassy, I was looking in the faces of people from all over the world. No country in the world has the diversity that we do. If, and that is what makes us um, the kind of diplomats we can we can be and the kind of leader in international affairs we can be because we represent everybody. You want somebody who looks Chinese or Somali or Ethiopian or Armenian or you name it, we got it. Um, who better to sit down with members of the world community and say, hey folks, um, let's see if we can't fix climate change rather than kill one another. To do that, we need um, an approach that is no longer uh, an approach different from the one we used after World War II. Very important because um, although there are certain presidents, actually all of our presidents have thought that it was easy enough to do diplomacy that they could put their high contributors into places of uh, senior positions. In point of fact, it takes um, skill. It takes negotiation skills, it takes influence skills, it takes language skills, it takes writing skills, it takes media skills, um, and it takes interpersonal skills. It takes, uh, how do you stand up to a bully? How do you get in to see someone when the person refuses to see you? How do you negotiate with a killer? How do you tell uh, the, um, the, a man who is helping to commit genocide to stop committing genocide? Just don't wake up and say, oh, this sounds like a nice thing to do today. I think I will do it. Um, the professional training provides the, the wherewithal, um, the, the, the personal wherewithal, the confidence and, and the ability to know that you have in you the wherewithal to confront a situation, whatever that situation is, including terrorist attacks. Um, the leadership ability to influence and bring people along with you, as well as the, the attitude and the patience that is required to accompany people in sometimes very difficult um, and negative circumstances. That takes training.
the history of the continent of Africa and its image in Western world goes back a long time. Um, it is both the blessing and the curse of the African continent to be resource rich. And people had been coming from the West and now from China to exploit African resources for centuries. I think that the slave trade had a huge impact on the attitude um, Americans have about Africa. And I think there is a misunderstanding of what the communities of, in African countries have to give us. Um, we have been, it goes back even to the history books where it's always the white man's burden, right? And that's the attitude we've had. And I literally mean white man's burden because there weren't that many women, white women, except missionaries perhaps going over there. So the white man's burden is the attitude we were raised with. It's very difficult um, to get around that. Uh, what the heck, burden, are you kidding? We wouldn't have cell phones because the minerals we need for our cell phones exist in Africa, number one. Number two, Africa is the oldest continent on Earth. It's where human beings came from. There's not a single problem that we face in this world today that has not been dealt with or is not being dealt with in Africa. The, what Africa has to teach us is, is um, a prism we have never picked up and looked through. And I think were we to do that, we'd have a very different focus and different kinds of policy one that promotes not just our military-to-military -military relationship, but also commercial, environmental, et cetera, et cetera. We have accompanied African people. Um, I think one of the things that I have found Americans don't really, we don't, don't understand is um, how well for the most part, African people and Americans get along. I have no idea if it is because we have interacted with um, African people who came, unfortunately, enslaved to the United States. But any, all the countries I visited, African people really like Americans. And we get along, we have a similar sense of humor. There's a rhythm, there's a dance, there's something that is, um, but there's kinship. When we accompany people, including people who are under siege from Islamic fundamentalists, uh, they will not forget us and they will continue to nurture the friendships. I think what Washington can do is to hold their leaders accountable, number one. Um, hold their leaders accountable to what's happening in the country and not slide back into the Cold War routine of, well, as long as you're doing what you, as long as you're helping us in the international fora, how you treat your people is of less importance. So we need to, um, I think, be very clear about the uh, expectations of the partnership. Um, number two, we need to focus on the peace of the civil society the people and not just the government. I am so mindful of the amount of money that is going toward military training. I think that's fabulous, by all means. But how much money is going into training the public servants? And how in the world can you have stable governments if you don't have people who, are, who know what they're doing? So let's give, um, let's give African countries the same respect the same responsibility and the same kind of um, handshake that we give to countries and other continents. Well, the return to the U.S. is, number one, a peaceful global village, which is always um, a better place than an unsecure global village. The return is a continent of resources. Uh, 
including amazing human resources. And the return is uh, what a partnership going forward to leave a better universe to our children. I think there's a great deal more interest in Africa than there was. There certainly are many, many more resources um, going into it. My concern is that we, that we use some of our relationships for our sake and not for the well-being of the people who are in that country. And that, that is really important um, in order to deny young people the reason to join Islamic gangs, um, the reason to burn down villages, or the reason to kill the members of the other political opposition.